following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Precepts of Alchemy Prakriti In relation to the sequence of lectures on the Zohar's alchemical precepts, we are going to continue on that theme. Following the lecture, The Two Serpents of Eden. So, once again, we should address the serpent in relation with the Hebrew letters as numerical living entities. And in relation to our Divine Mother Kundalini, the magical brazen serpent of the divine or the divine brazen serpent of our, of our magical powers. The title of this lecture is uh, Prakriti, which is a Sanskrit word. Prakriti, from Sanskrit, is a compound word consisting of the prepo prepositional prefix pra, meaning forwards or progression, and kriti, a noun form from the verbal root kri, to make or to do. Therefore, prakriti means literally production or bringing forth, originating and by extension of meaning, it also signifies the primordial or original state or condition or form of anything, primary original substance. The root of or parent of Prakriti is Mula Prakriti or root of Prakriti. Prakriti is to be considered with Vikriti. Vikriti signifying change or an alteration of some kind or a production or evolution from the Prakriti, which preceded this from the Theosophical Glossary. Master Samael on the Or addresses uh, Prakriti, the Divine Mother, in different books. In this Prakriti PDF's first graphic, we have a quotation from the book Parsifal Unveiled, where we read, Kundalini Yoga teaches in a brilliant way that the Bhujangini or serpentine power is found coiled three and a half times inside the coccygeal chakra, which is called, of course, the chakra Muladhara. The three coils represent the three gunas of Prakriti, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. 
It is an axiom of the occult wisdom that the remaining half tail represents Vikritis, demonification of Prakriti, the eternal feminine. Parsifal unveiled by Samael Unveiler. We can see that the Sanskrit word Vikritis is plural of Vikriti, which is very similar to Prakriti. The term Kriti joins them, which in Sanskrit, in Sanskrit means to make or to do. Therefore, Prakriti means literally production or bringing forth. It relates to the forces of nature in itself because usually people translate Prakriti as nature. But it is not nature as we know it, but in an abstract manner. Prakriti emerges from, from Mula Prakriti. The word Mula means root. The prefix Mula is also found in Mula Dara. Mula meaning root and Dara meaning base or support. Thus, the chakra Muladhara, which is located between the anus and the genitalia, at the base of the spine, is where we have the root, the base, or support of the power of Kundalini, or Prakriti. Hinduism associates uh, Mula Prakriti, the primordial substance from which all the universe is created, with uh, Parabrahman, the abstract intelligence within the absolute. Mula Prakriti, the primordial substance, is what we call the chaotic matter. In Kabbalah, we always mention that Mula Prakriti, or the root of Prakriti, is the Ein Sof. So the Ein Sof in itself is Mula Prakriti the root of the Divine Mother, Prakriti, where we find the three gunas in equilibrium. These three gunas are called Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. <coughs> Sattva is in relation to the light. Rajas is in relation to action and tamas is in relation to inertia, which means all the possibilities of creation are there equilibrated within the bosom of the Divine Mother space, which is the unmanifested mother, or Ein Sof, as we Kabbalistically call it. So in the PDF's graphics, we find the image, the symbol of Mula Prakriti, the Ein Sof, within the space, carrying in her bosom the symbolic three primary forces. Master Samael On Veor always talks about the Ein Sof and tells us in his books that each one of us has his own particular Ein Sof. Thus, within, the, within uh, our Ein Sof, we find the three primary atoms that are called in Sanskrit Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. They relate to the law of creation. These three primary forces, when manifesting in the universe, are what Christianity calls Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and what we in Kabbalah call Keter, Chokhmah, and Bina. These three primary forces have to awake all the creative possibilities of the Ein Sof, the Mula Prakriti. And this is why they appear in the universe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in order for the Ein Sof to develop consciousness knowledge. And this is precisely the main point here when entering into this topic. The matter itself, as a primordial substance, Prakriti, 
exist in all creation. Thus, we had to develop the intelligent power of Prakriti in order to manipulate, to equilibrate, to handle her three gunas. This is why Master Samael explains that in the beginning of creation, the three gunas enter into disequilibrium. Yet, they become equilibrated when we penetrate within the bosom of the Divine Mother, the Prakriti. This disequilibrium happens because the three primary forces within each one of us do not know how to control what we call creation or what the Bible calls Bereshith, Genesis. And this is precisely the meaning of the beauty of this creation. Hinduism teaches that this creation or production that Parabrahman or the abstract intelligence of the space can bring about into existence is only possible thanks to the Prakriti or the primordial substance. So this is how the different levels of the universe appear when such intelligence enters into action. We address these levels in the lectures where we talk about the seven cosmos. Here we are just briefly commenting upon them. Remember the three coils of the Kundalini serpent that are dormant in the Muladhara chakra represent the three gunas. It is obvious that in us the three gunas are imbalanced. The three gunas in Christianity are represented by the three traitors of Christ, which are Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas. In Buddhism, they are represented by the three daughters of Mara. The gunas are perverted in us as the three aspects of desire within our three brains, which we have to balance because the Vikritis modification of the three gunas of the Prakriti are in us. The outcome of the imbalance of the or the alteration of the three primary substance or elements that the consciousness should learn how to handle through the Holy Trinity. Obviously, when we do not have knowledge, when we are rooted in ignorance, in tamas, we create only ego. This is why Krishna states that the Prakriti or the Vikritis, which are the modification of the three gunas of the Prakriti, are the four elements or tattvas, the space as a tattva akash, the fifth element, the mind, which is the sixth, the seventh, the intellect, when we reach the humanoid level. And the eighth, the ego, that we have in abundance. All of these eight modifications are vikritis, the outcome or the modification of the three gunas. Vikritis have become perversions in us because we don't know how to handle the three gunas. This is why Master Krishna states that we have to balance the gunas in us in order to reach self-realization. Let us read what the Bhagavad Gita says in relation to this topic. The great Prakriti is my womb, in that I place the seed. Thence, O oh Bharata, is the birth of all beings. Whatever forms are produced, O oh Kundreya, in any womb whatsoever, the Prakriti is their womb, and I am the seed given father. Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, these three gunas, aspects or qualities, born of the Prakriti, almighty arm one, bind fast the embodied to the body. Of these gunas, sattva, which 
from its stainlessness is luminous and good, binds by attachment to happiness and by attachment to knowledge. O impeccable one! Know thou, O Kuntreya, that Rayas is of the nature of passion, the source of desire and attachment. This guna binds fast the embodied being to action. But know thou, O Bharata, that guna tamas is born of ignorance, deluding all embodied beings, it binds fast the embodied being by heedlessness, laziness, and a sleep, a sleep consciousness, the sleep of soul consciousness. So, as you can see, these uh, three gunas are perverted within each one of us. <coughs> this graphic shows us very clearly that the gunas are behind Krishna like the three children. Because in reality, the three gunas are just elements placed in our three brains with which we can work with. The prakriti is independent from the gunas, but the gunas emerge from her as children emerge from the womb of their mother. This is what we have to understand. So in us, we have the three gunas unbalanced. These are the materials with which we have created many egos. Yes, unfortunately, because of our ignorance and lack of knowledge, we have created only perversity. Every single being in the universe has the three gunas. Thus, when we start awakening the Kundalini, then the Divine Mother help us to control or balance the gunas. In the bosom of the asteroid space or the ains of, the three gunas are equilibrated. But when they enter into this equilibrium, creation starts. In us, the three gunas correspond with the three coils of the serpent in the Muladhara chakra. And the half coil represents the vikritis, which are the modifications that we need and could develop but with intelligence. This is what we have to comprehend and understand about the three and a half coils of the serpent, which relates to the Kundalini, which everyone has, but not awakened. The Master Samael states that when the serpent, <coughs> that is coiled three and a half times in the Muladhara Chakra, awakens, it emits a sound like the letter S, like and it starts its ascension to the spinal column. We were previously talking about the serpent, and we will address it again in relation to Kabbalah. We will address how important it is to understand what prakriti is to understand what the three coils of the serpent are in us and what the symbols of these three coils are in relation to the prakriti. The primordial substance, prakriti, the gunas, and vikritis, with which we can create and perform magical things, are inside of us. If we know how to awaken it, Master Samael Onveor states in the book uh, Parsifal Unveiled, Prakriti, the Divine Mother, is a primordial substance of nature. Several substances, different elements, and sub-elements exist within the universe. But all of these are different manifestations of a single substance. The Great Mother, the Prakriti, the primordial matter, is a pure akasha, contained within the entire space. Maha, Bambantara, and Pralaya are two very important Sanskrit terms with which Gnostic students must become familiarized. Maha, Bambantara is the great cosmic day. Pralaya 
is the great cosmic night. During the great day, the universe exists. When the great night arrives, the universe ceases to exist and becomes dust, dissolved within the bosom of the Prakriti, which we said is the Ensof. The immensurable infinite space is full of solar systems, which have their Mahamambantaras and their Pralayas. While some are in their Mahamambantaras, others are in their Pralaya. Millions and billions of universes are being born and dying within the bosom of the Prakriti. Every cosmos is born from the Prakriti and is dissolved within the Prakriti. Every world is a ball of fire that becomes ignited and extinguished in the bosom of Prakriti. Everything is born from the Prakriti. Everything returns to the Prakriti. She is the Great Mother. Regarding Prakriti, the primordial substance and her modifications, the book of Genesis states, And Yod Hava Elohim, that in Sanskrit is called Parabrahman, the intelligence of the absolute manifested in creation, formed Adam from the dust of Adama. Obviously, in this case, the word Adama from the Hebrew language relates to Prakriti, the Divine Mother, which represents the space, the Akasha, the primordial matter, and the dust represents the elements and substances or modifications of that primordial substance. Vav, the Yod Hava Elohim, para Rahman, planted a garden, a prakriti in nature, its ward in Eden, in Yesod. And there, as Anupadaka Tadwa, he put Adam, the Adi Tadwa, whom he had formed. So, from the Vav, out of Adama, the Akasha, made yod Elohim, para Brahman, to grow every tree, living that weak force, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, the spinal column, also in the midst of the human garden, which is prakriti in the psychosomatic human nature, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the sexual creative force in the psychosomatic human nature. Vav, the river, Nahera, light, brightness, prana, went out of the at, the top of the spinal column, the upper Eden, to water the garden, his psychosomatic nature, or lower Eden. Through Vav, from thence, from Yesod, it, the Akasha Tadwa, was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, the Tejas Tadwa. That is it which compasses the whole land of Avila, which is Gebura where there is gold, and the goal of that land is good. There is bdellium and an onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, Apastadwa. The same is that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia, Gesed. And the name of the third river is Hedikel, Bayutadwa. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, Tifereth. And the fourth river is Euphrates, Privitadwa. And Yodhava Elohim 
which is the Anupadaka Tatwa, took the men, the Adi Tatwa, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, 8 to 15. Adama is represented here in this painting by Jofra, where he shows us Prakriti, the Divine Mother, with her feet on the earth, having a spiral galaxy as her womb, from within which all the infinite possibilities of creation emerged into the universe. Agnosticism, we teach that Prakriti, the Divine Mother, has five fundamental aspects. Every aspect, as a fundamental primordial substance, has the three gunas and vikritis in order to create any universe. So understand that in order to control the three gunas, we must know how to work with the five aspects of the Divine Mother Prakriti within our psychosomatic nature. Since every single aspect of Prakriti has the three gunas. Thus, in our case, when we talk about our own individual Divine Mother, everyone has their own, obviously, she has the three gunas. <coughs> Thus, with her help, we control creation. This is why the book of uh, Genesis states that Yohava Elohim, which in English is translated as the Lord God, formed Adam from the dust of Adama. This Adam is a true man, the true human being is formed from the dust of Adama. We will say, in other words, Yohava Elohim formed Adam by wisely manipulating the three gunas and the vikritis of the Divine Mother. <coughs> Simple as that. Thus, by wisely manipulating the three gunas is how God creates. This is why we have to awaken the Kundalini, which is coiled three and a half times in the Muladhara Chakra. When that Kundalini awakens, then God, through the Anupadaka Tadwa, which is our case, in, in our case will be Bina, of our own particular Yohava Elohim, will begin controlling through the pineal gland the three gunas in us in order for Adam to emerge in our psychosomatic nature. That is precisely what we have to understand. <coughs> Yolhava Elohim and uh, Adama is the same Brahma Prakriti or Purusha Prakriti. They correspond to the divine, active, creative, male-female power of all religions. Yohava Elohim as Brahma, Brahma, or Abraham, makes the world out of Adama, or Prakriti. <clears throat> the same creative process that happens through Brahma in the universe happens through Abraham within the individual human being. It is the same process as when the Cosmo creators control the three gunas of the Divine Mother Cosmos in order to create worlds, planets. But that is a matter of gods. Eventually, if we reach that level, then we can manipulate the three gunas of the cosmos. But first, we need to learn how to manipulate the three gunas in us, in this planet, with Mother Nature in the fourth dimension. For that, we have worked with the three gunas in relation to the elemental magic, or we will say the elemental, elemental fairy mother, because the Divine Mother as the fifth aspect is the elemental fairy mother in us. 
that relates to the forces of the fourth dimension, the instinctual forces in us. Obviously, the Divine Mother guides us in the sexual magic in order for us to know what to eat. Because remember that the three gunas relate to the three types of food that we can digest in the physical body. We need tamasic food, rajasic food, and sattvic food. Matthew Samael explains this in his books. The elemental fairy female magician, the Divine Mother, is the one who tells us what to eat and what not to eat in our spiritual development and the control of the gunas when we are awakened. But when we are not awakened, we have to follow what the Master Samael on the earth tells us in his books. There are three types of food. Sattvic, Rajasic, and Tamasic. Sattvic foods are constituted of flowers, grains, fruits, and that which is called love. Rajasic foods are strong, passionate, excessively hot, too salty, exaggeratedly sweet, etc. Indeed, Tamasic foods are constituted by blood and red meat. Samael on the earth. We have to moderately, moderately eat, or with moderation, all types of tattwick foods in order to control the three gunas. Yes, we have to control them. Yet understand it is the Divine Mother who help us to control the gunas whether it is Mother Nature or the Elemental Mother, or even Mother Death. Because in order to walk the path of equilibrium, we must annihilate the three perverted gunas in us. Yes, in order to overcome the three furious, furious in us, the three furious, have to we have to watch the Divine Mother Death. This is in order for her to annihilate the perverted goodness that all of us have alive. As we stated in the beginning, these uh, three gunas are perverted in us because of our ignorance. We have transformed them into the three traitors of Christianity, Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas. They are also represented in Masonry as the three assassins of Hiram Abif, whom everyone has within. We can also refer to them in Buddhism as the three daughters of Mara. These are the same gunas. We always see these three perverted modifications of the gunas in many different religions with different names. The point that we have to understand is this. They are perverted creation that we have made because of our ignorance. And the only one who can help us to balance them is the Divine Mother in any of her aspects. Because again, there are five aspects of the Divine Mother Kundalini. Now, if we follow the sequence of lectures that we have last time in relation to the Serpents of Eden, here again we are addressing the development of the Brazen Serpent, according to the Book of Zohar. So we are going to go deeper into this theme, because people think that when we address the Kundalini Serpent, this is only related to India, and, to, and, and they don't know what the Bible states. Yet the Zohar mentions this serpentine power in every hidden manner, a very hidden manner, <coughs> which we are going to unveil for the benefit of those who want to understand what the snake symbolizes in the Bible. We are addressing the three Hebrew letters 
Yod, Vav, and Final Nun in the previous lectures. They spell the, spell the word Eon. The word Eon reminds us of Eon because Yod, Vav, and Final Nun can be read as Eon as well. Now, there is a word that is very significant yet common in this day and age. This word is Zion. And what is Zion? Well, alchemically speaking, Zion is related to the alchemical work that we perform. Let us read the following biblical quotation in accordance with alchemy, with Gnosis. Therefore, here said Adonai Jehovah, here I am in Yesod at Zion, a stone, a tried stone, a cornerstone, precious, founded in Yesod. The faithful will not rush. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16. The former is an alchemical statement. It's translated in many ways because there are many translations of the Bible. Yet the people who translate this particular verse are not alchemists. But we are alchemists. And we know what we are talking about. For instance, <coughs> the letter that we write before Yod, Vav, and Final Nun is a letter Zadi, that is commonly associated with the word Sadik. When Kabbalists see the letter Sadi, they say Sadik, which means righteous. When we observe the letter Sadi, it looks like an inclined letter Nun. In Kabbalah, we know that the letter Nun is just a letter Vav bent on top and in the bottom. It is bent in the neck and bent at the base of the spine. So a letter Vav bent on top and in the bottom is shown in the shape of the letter Nun. Yet the letter Nun shown in the shape of the letter, of the letter Zadi is inclined forward. This in order to hold on its back, which is the letter Vav, the spinal column, a letter Yod. In other lectures, we explain that in the shape of the letter Zadi, we see the alchemical work with the cross, because the alchemical cross is a method that alchemists use in order to rise along the spinal column, the Yod or Shakti potential energy of Nun, from the coccyx to the head. This is why next to the letter Zadi, we see the Zadik, or Lord Christ, Yeshua, carrying the cross on his shoulders. The vertical line of the cross symbolizes the man, and the horizontal, the woman performing the sexual act. In other words, the word Zadik is also associated with chastity. And I will betroth thee to me forever. Yes, I will betroth thee to me in righteousness, which means Zadik and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. In the shape of the letter Zadi, we see the Tzalem, Hebrew, for image, of the Lord carrying the cross from the very bottom of the spinal column, the coccyx, towards the mount of the schools, which is our head. 
The spinal column is precisely the Mount of Zion. When we alchemically inquire, where is the Mount of Zion? Because the, the Bible talks about the Mount of Zion. We immediately know and understand that uh, the word Zion is addressing the spinal column of the ones who work with alchemy. Alchemical meaning of the word Zion. The letter Zari represents the alchemist. The letter Yod is the head of the alchemist. The letter Vav is the spinal column of the of the alchemist. The heart and sex as well. The letter Nun, final, elevates the sexual energy through the spinal medulla of the alchemist. The foot of Nun, final, reaches even the clipoth of the alchemist. Thus, through Nun is how the alchemist enters into the purification of the gunas. That is why the letter Nun, which means fish, is inclined in the shape of the letter Zari. This inclination also symbolizes humbleness, humility, and the way we enter into the new Jerusalem or the new Zion. That's why Isaiah in chapter 52, verse 1, stated, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean fornicators. When people read the former quotation, they think that the soul of a particular righteous person will eventually enter into a particular fortress. Indeed. But that fortress is the spinal medulla. If you visualize the 33 vertebrae, that is the Mount of Zion on which every alchemist works. Because in order to enter into that eon, Zion, you have to be a Zadig, meaning the one who knows the mystery of alchemy or righteousness. Let us see how the Zohar unveiled this so easily and beautifully for us. We explain about the Prakriti because it is precisely the Prakriti, the Shekinah, which is the brass and serpentine force, who ascends the Mount of Zion. If you observe your spinal column and your head, you will see that it has a serpentine shape. Our physical head is on top of the spinal column, which has a serpentine shape. Thus, this is why a human head is always the head of the serpent. This is why the biblical serpent is always drawn with a human face. The Bible calls it the serpent of bronze, or the brazen serpent, and the tempting serpent of Eden. So when we work in Zion, we are working with the serpents. It is coming into my mind at this very moment, how in this day and age, some people talk about the reptilian people and how they make jokes about it. To tell you the truth, a serpent is a reptile. Kabbalistically, Moses is a crocodile and a serpent a reptilian, and every single master that awakens the Kundalini eventually becomes a reptilian being, <coughs> which means a god, in other words. But not like that ridiculousness that you find on the internet. We also find reptilian initiates amongst the Aztecs, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, among the Mayans, Kukulkan and Wotan. 
They are reptilian gods. In the Bible, God commands Moses to worship a reptile, a serpent. Numbers chapter 21, verse 8 states, And Yodhava said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Listen. This is, this is not, like many people think, an actual brazen serpent or a snake that was alive. Ignorant people do not understand this alchemical symbol. We had to study alchemy in order to know what the serpent means. Because Jesus of Nazareth, who carried the cross towards the Mount of the Skulls, which in Hebrew is Golgotha, did it. Indeed, by worshiping, better said, by alchemically working with the same serpent that Moses worshipped in the wilderness. This is why, that, why Jesus uh, said in, in the Gospels, in John uh, 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up to Golgotha. Yes, Jesus was another reptile master. In other words, an immortal, because the brazen serpent gives power to anyone who knows how to work with the Prakriti. The brazen serpent is a symbol of the Divine Mother Nature that is controlled, manipulated by the forces of the Holy Spirit when we know how. So in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, we read, Therefore hear, said Adonai Jehovah, here I am in Yesod at Zion, a stone, a tri stone, a cornerstone, precious, founded in Yesod. The faithful will not rush. Adonai is the God of the earth, Malkut, Adonia. And Yol He Vav He is Jehovah, of the one who works with the sacred name of Jah. And who is the one who works with the sacred name of Jah? It is the alchemist who fills the gap of He with his jaw. Remember that we have said that God is the word of creation. In the word of creation is Jah. Thus, when Jah works, when Yod works with He, then that Yod fills the gap of the letter He. Thus, the letter He is no longer He, but Het. And what does the letter Het mean? Het means spiritual life, by means of the union of the electric, electric effluvia of the spinal columns of the male with the female, thanks to the letter Yod. So the letter Het, which is the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, is the mystery of life. Hai. Because when you, when you fill the gap of He with the letter Yod of Jah, the Yod protrudes from Het. Then we have Het and Yod, which is how we spell Hai, which means life. Thus, Jah becomes Hai. This means that Jah is Hai. In other words, the letter Het is the Yod filling the gap of He. Thus, by doing so, that is, by raising the Yod or Shakti sexual potential through our spine during Saha Maituna, we unite the two Vavs or the two serpentine powers of the spinal column of man and woman. 
as we explain in other lectures. The yod or shakti sexual potential rising on the back of the letter nun, which means fish, symbolizes the sperm and, sperm and ovum transmuted into energy. This is the alchemical meaning of the letter zadi. If we observe the word Zion, we will see two letters, Nun and two letters Yod in it. The first Nun is an inclined letter Nun forming the shape of the letter Zadi, which is carrying a letter Yod on its back. Both letters make the shape of the letter Zadi. The second letter Yod follows the letter Tzadi, and at the end of the word is the second Nun as final. Again, the letter Yod symbolizes the Shakti potential of Nun, the fish or sperm. The Yod is the prophet Joshua, who is called the son of Nun. Joshua in Hebrew means savior. Joshua in English is Jesus. This is why Joshua is named the son of Nun, and also because Nun symbolizes Moses, the Leviathan. And why is Moses Nun or the Leviathan? Because Moses spells Hashem backwards, which is the serpent and power of yod the Shekinah, taken from the waters. And what do alchemists take from Hashamayim, the waters? They take the Shakti potential of the nun, the fish, which is the yod in between the two mems of Mayim. This is why Moses is called symbolically the Leviathan, the nun, which literally means fish in Aramaic. In the book of Job, chapter 41, verse 1, we read, Can you draw out the Leviathan with a hook? Amazingly, the word hook is written with two valves, two spinal columns, man and woman. Moses, the Leviathan, really symbolizes the willpower that is developed when the alchemist, the righteous, draws out the yod, the shakti potential, from the nun, the fish, the sperm, and the oven, and sublimates it, sublimates this energy along the spinal column. Thus, willpower is Moses, who is the nun, the Leviathan, and the one who faithfully follows Moses is the yod, Joshua, the son of nun or the son of the Leviathan, Moses. In other words, as Moses lifted up the Shakti potential of the serpent in the wilderness, even so must Joshua, Jesus, the son of Nun, the son of man, the son of the Yod, of the sperm and ovum of man and woman, be sublimated to Golgotha. Let us follow now the Zadikim, which is plural for righteous, the righteous ones. The sequence of the Zadikim according to the Old Testament. Joshua is called a Zadik. Joseph in Egypt is also called a righteous one. A Zadik. Moses is also called a Sadiq. David is also a Sadiq, a righteous one. So all the prophets are Zadiks or righteous ones. The Bible always states that we have to become righteous. Yet in order to become a righteous, a Sadiq, we have to perform the alchemical work explained in the shape of the letter Zadi. This is why its shape shows 
an inclined letter noon, as if saying, be humble before God, the Yod. Because the power of Keter rises like the letter Yod on the spine of the Sadikim. And this means chastity. Such is the meaning of Sadik. This is why the power of Yod Chava says in Isaiah 28, verse 16. Here I am in Yesod, at Zion. Who is Yesod? In Yesod, sex are the two nuns, or letter nuns, the sperm and the oven of Zion, meaning at the base of the spinal column, that is Zion, the fortress, is where we have the final noon. Through Yesod, we build the physical body and internal bodies. So, Yesod is the very foundation of the spinal column and the tree of life. This is very clear. So, here I am in Yesod at Zion, a stone, the philosophical stone, the cubic stone of Yesod, the tried stone, the corner stone, precious, founded in Yesod. The faithful will not rush. What do you understand when you read the former quotation? The faithful are also the righteous ones. They will not rush. Means they will not fornicate. Because when you are in a sexual act, you should not rush to the orgasm. So do not rush in Yesod. Control the sexual act. Control your fire. That is the meaning of the faithful will not rush. This is precisely an alchemical statement given by Isaiah to those who know the mystery of the letter Nun, the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, as we already learned. Nun is the shape of the letter uh, Nun in the shape of the letter Sari at the end of the word Zion. Now, there is another letter that also has the letter Nun in its shape. And this is the letter Ayin. Yet, the shape of the letter Ayin is different. The letter Ayin is another letter Nun, but openly extended, having the letter Zayin as a vertical erected phallus in the middle of it. This means that the female sexual power of Zayin protrudes from the letter Nun, which, as we already explained, is a broken letter Vav. When we write Ayin and Tzadi together, we spell, spell the word Otz, which in Hebrew means tree. Therefore, the word Otz, tree, has two letters, Nun in it. An inclined letter Nun in the shape of the letter Tzadi and an openly extended letter Nun in the shape of the letter Ayin. Thus, alchemically speaking, the letter Nun is the base of Otz Chaim and Otz Da'at, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. This is why the Kabbalists of the Zohar state that out of Adama may Yodhava Elohim to grow every tree, every alchemist, every Zadik, that is pleasant to the sight and good for a spiritual food. The tree of life also in the midst of the alchemist garden, his physicality, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So all alchemists are trees pleasant to the sight 
and good for spiritual food. Indeed, because any alchemist, any white magician, is represented with the letter Vav, <coughs> which is in the middle of Sadi and Ayin, making the word Ots or the Wizard of Oz, a priest who works with the forces of Nun, the Divine Mother, the Prakriti, in his spine. That is the Wizard of Oz. Bereshith Bera Elohim, in the beginning, created Elohim. Alchemically, these words are read. Brit Esh Bera Elohim, pact of fire, created Elohim. These words, says the Zohar, Bereshit Bera Elohim are included in the first commandment, which is known as the fear of the Lord. The first step in the acquiring of true wisdom and knowledge. It is also called the beginning because it is the true gate through which we enter into the higher mysteries of the divine life and is the foundation upon which the world, the world exists. When we read that the Zohar states that the words Bereshit Bera Elohim are included in the first commandment, which is known as the fear of the Lord, we understand that in order to comprehend this statement, we have to be alchemists. In uh, previous lectures, we explained that the word Bereshith is broken as Brit Esh, which means pact of fire. Brit Esh is also related to the circumcision or the pact of fire that we had to do in order to enter into the mysteries. We know that circumcision is milah in Hebrew. But when we say Brit in Hebrew, this is associated with the pact of God with alchemists, which is in relation with circumcision, which is the surgical removal of the foreskin, prepus, the prepuce, from the human penis, which relates to sexual animal sensation. Circumcision is a ceremony practiced not only in Judaism, but also in Islam and other minor religions. The cutting of the foreskin prepus from the human penis, which is called circumcision, is a preamble to the sexual alchemical pact with God that the circumcised will eventually perform in the beginning if he decides to enter into the spiritual path that leads to Zion. This religion ceremony is very painful for the male child. Later on, at his adulthood, he will know the alchemical meaning of it. He then will learn that he has to cut from his body, mind, and spirit, the nefesh, the bestiality of his animal soul, for that, he has to learn in the beginning how to transmute his sexual energy into willpower. This is in order to enter into the mysteries of the first commandment. Thus, if we do not practice alchemical justity, we are not fulfilling the first commandment, even if we are physically circumcised. This is what alchemists call Brit Esh, and what the Kabbalists in the Zohar state is related with the first commandment. Let us read, uh, continue reading the Zohar. 
There are three kinds of fear, two of which are of no avail in the search after truth and have no reference except to bodily or physical enjoyment and delight and the preservation of wealth and therefore are altogether unmeritorious. True fear is that affection which arises from a feeling of reverence toward the Holy One as being all-powerful. The rootless root of all life an existence in whose eyes the illimitable universe with all of its inhabitants are as nothing. This is the fear which when exercised tends to bring nearer the time when the divine will shall universally prevail through the world. The beginning of wisdom, chokmah, is the fear of Job Chava and the knowledge that of the Holy Ones is understanding. Bina, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. When people read the former quotation, they do not understand that such a fear is to be in awe. In order to be in awe of Job Chava, we have to be in the sexual act because it is there when you experience the presence of Yod Chava. Such is the fear, better said, the awe that we are taking, talking about here. It is not that we have to be afraid of God or some divinity. The book of Sohar states, In uttering these words, Ravi Shimon was affected to tears and said, Woe unto me, whether I speak or keep silence. For if I speak, sinners will know how to worship and serve the Lord. And refraining there from will, those add to their guilt. And if I keep silent, then I keep back knowledge that ought to be imparted to you. The man whose fear springs from a dread or affliction that may assail him falls under the power of and influence of evil that becomes his tormentor. The only right fear is that described by a scripture as the beginning of wisdom is to be in awe of Yod Chava in that where we find the Holy Ones. Ava and Aima from Bina. The word Teheloth, the beginning, is associated with Le Tehelev, to emulsify, which, was, which is what alchemists do. Because Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 does not say Bereshith, the beginning, but Teheloth, which also signifies the beginning. But why is not written Bereshit? It is in order to point at Le Tehelev, because to alter the state of matter is what alchemists do. Alchemists emulsify when they mix, when they wisely transform elements within their psychosomatic nature while performing the sexual act. We are emulsifying the primordial substance in the beginning of our alchemical work, and that is the beginning of wisdom, which is also British, the pact of fire. Such pact of fire is performed when we are in the sexual act, when we feel the fire in our sexual organs. Such is the beginning of wisdom. If you know how to transmute your sexual forces, that is, in the beginning of wisdom. Through sexual alchemy, by being a righteous one, a tzaddik, is how prakriti, the Shekinah, rises in our spinal column, 
in the city of Zion. If you do not do emulsify, you are just wasting your time because le tehelev, to emulsify, is associated with the first commandment, that is, to be in awe of Yod Chava in the very sexual act. Rabbi Shimon Bar Hohai said in the Zohar, For if I speak, sinners will know how to worship and serve the Lord. The sinners in this case are us, the fornicators, who will know how to worship the Lord. Yet, if we do not know it, we will add to our punishment. And this is why he is in tears. I mean, if we don't do it, we will add to our punishment. In other words, he says, Woe is me, because if I explain this, I will help the sinners to stop being sinners. But if they keep doing what they are doing, which is fornicating, they will add more to their karma, because they will know what they are doing. Whoever begins the divine life with it, with Brit Esh, begins well and observes all the other precepts which are included in it. Did you understand that Bereshit Bera Elohim in the beginning created Elohim? Or did you understand that Brit Esh Bera Elohim? In other words, did you understand that if you worship your Chava in this alchemical manner, you are creating an Elohim within you? Because Bereshit created Elohim, our monad, the heavens, our souls, and the earth, our solar bodies. On the contrary, whoever exercises it not breaks and violates them. And to him may be applied the words of the scripture. Whoever exercises not this, the following words will be added to, to him or to her. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the great deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. The former statement of Genesis is directly applied to the hypocrites who fornicate in spite of knowing that they should not. For them, their earth, their psychosomatic nature is without form and void since darkness is upon the face of their subconsciousness, unconsciousness, and infraconsciousness. And because the fire of the Holy Spirit, of the Elohim, who in the pineal gland moves upon the face of their sexual waters, is always cast out in the beginning. Thus they self-remove the light from their heads. That is, they self behead themselves by means of their abominable spasm, their filthy orgasm. Therefore, in Genesis verse, I mean chapter 1, verse 2, it describes the four kinds of punishments inflicted upon the ungodly, that is to say, upon the hypocritical fornicators. The book of Zohar states, Tahu, without form, the punish of, punishment of strangulation referred to by the prophet Isaiah in the chapter 34, verse 11. And he will stretch over her the measuring core of Tahu, confusion, and the plumb stone of Bohu, emptiness. The cord of Tohu ve Bohu, which ejects great stones by which fornicator as stoned, which is the second kind of punishment. 
How does the one who fornicates receives the punishment, the punishment of strangulation? During the contraction of the orgasm, the sphincters and prostate violently force the crystal solar light stored in the semen to be expelled out of the body. So, through the orgasm, if the sexual cord, sexual cord named Ida stretches out, thus stopping the flux of sexual creative life fluid from flowing towards Adam, the brain, and leading it to unconsciousness and a spiritual death by the increasing of a deficiency of the living Christic light. Deficiency of the living Christic light. When what is in chastity and transmute the sexual energy, the Christic light stored in the semen is sublimated and nourishes the blood in the heart, which in turn feeds the brain. All the creative energy or sexual force is placed in the heart. The brain takes from the heart in order to be enlightened, awakened. But when you fornicate, your punishment is by strangulation, meaning that the Christic like stored in the semen no longer goes up to your heart and brain, because through the orgasm, you have stretched the cord ida, thus strangling yourself by preventing the Christic life and light of your sex and heart from rushing to the brain. Remember that it is stated that Eve, the serpent Ida, ate of the fruit, the Christic light stored in the semen of our sexual organs and gave to her husband, Adam, the brain. So that, that is the meaning of strangulation, <coughs> where the brain is no longer in communion with the fires of the heart, because we have strangled the Christic light from the blood through the orgasm. Let us now talk about the second punishment where the court of Ida, the court of Tohu Vevohu, ejects great stones by which fornicators are stoned. Therefore, here, said Adonai Jehovah, here I am in Yesod at Zion, a stone, a tribe stone, a corner stone, precious, founded in Yesod, the faithful will not rush. The Lord abides in the stone. Thus, when we eject the Lord, then the stone remains without force. Thus, we are spiritually killed with our own stone. This is also related to sex. Let us read what the Master Samael on the or stated. During the sexual act, our seminal substance descends into its corresponding cavity. When this seminal substance is spilled, we then lose millions of Christic solar atoms, stones, instantaneously. These solar atoms, stones, are substituted by millions of demonic atoms, stones, from Klippoth, from hell, which entered through the Brahmanic cord by means of the contractions of the genital orgasmic movements. So, through the orgasm, the Christic solar atoms of light are replaced by demonic lunar atoms of darkness or stones that kill us spiritually. Therefore, I clinically speaking, stoning 
is a physical and a spiritual self-induced punishment. So, let the hypocritical fornicated, fornicator Pharisees that believe that they are without sin and who interpret the Bible to the dead letter be the first ones to throw their defamatory tohu bebohu stones of accusation against us, the Gnostics. The third punishment is darkness, hoshek, or death by passion of fire, as it is written, when, as in the Garden of Eden, Ye hear his voice out of the mist of the darkness, for because of the orgasm, the mountain of Zion did burn with passional fire. Then spoke the solar logos incarnated within Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that transmute his libido follows me. Therefore shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light stored in the semen of life. Darkness is simply the absence of solar light. The solar Christ is the light that grants us awareness of the internal worlds and of our inner God. But when we fornicate, we violently afford the Christic solar light stored in the semen to be expelled out of the body. Thus, darkness is the only element that remains upon the face of our deep, our consciousness. That's why Judges chapter 16, verse 20 and 21 states, Then Delilah, or Lilith, through the orgasm, drained the strength of the sun out of Samson, Samson's gonads, and said, The Philistines, psychic aggregates, are upon you, Samson. Samson awoke from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that because of the orgasm, Yodhava had left him. Then the Philistines, his psychic aggregates, seized his consciousness and gouged the Christic solar light out of his pituitary and pineal eyes. Thus, as Sansom, now we are bound with bronze chains and forced to grind or grind grain in the wheel of Samsara. If we close our physical eyes and try to see within our own subconsciousness with the eyes of the spirit, we find darkness. And all of that filthiness, all those egos, or Philistines. Now, as Samson, we want to shake ourselves free. But this is not easy. For that, we had to work hard in alchemy in order to overcome the darkness. Because we made that darkness with our sexual behavior. The words and the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters refer to the fourth mode of punishment, death by beheading with a sword. It is written, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword, 
which turn every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.24 This flaming sword bears the name of spirit and symbolizes the inflection of death meted out of the transgressors of the commandments of the law. In other words, fornicators sell behead themselves because the sexual fire stored in their sexual creative waters that in the beginning should victoriously rise through their spinal column up toward their pineal gland by means of the will of the Holy Spirit is instead by, me by means of their evil will cast out because of their filthy orgasm. This is how they self-cut their heads off and send them down into the abyss. This is what literally happened to this great initiate Zanoni, which if you spell his name with Hebrew letters, it will be with Sadi in the beginning. Zanoni was an immortal master, but he fell in love with a singer in, Na in Naples, Italy. He fornicated with her. Thus, the outcome of his transgression was death by beheading. This is how Zanoni lost his head in the guillotine. A very cruel example of this type of punishment. Spiritually speaking, one loses the head when one fornicates. Though this is how the Zohar explains these uh, four punishments, which are academically written in the beginning in Genesis. Thus, if we do not comprehend the first precept, which is Brit Esh, the pact of fire, created Elohim, we then do not comprehend the other precepts, because whoever begins the divine life with it begins well and observes all the other precepts which are included in it. Listen very carefully. Brit Esh bera Elohim. The pact of fire creates Elohim. Bereshit creates Elohim. This means that the pact of chastity and fire creates an Elohim within you. But if you do not do it, then you, as a psychosomatic earth, will remain formal, formless and void, and darkness will be always upon the face of your psyche, and the Spirit of God will move away from the face of your creative waters, which, as we already explained, such waters are your sexual waters. The Zohar states, Having described the first precept, the fear of the Lord, come, we know, we now, we should know the second, which is intimately associated with it and never separated from it. That second precept is perfect love. Did you apprehend that? The former quotation means <coughs> after knowing how to transmute our sexual energy in the sexual act, we must know about perfect love because Brit Esh, the pact of fire, is not just sexual transmutation but also the development of perfect love, which everyone should cherish and, and, and entertain toward the Creator. If it be asked, what is perfect love? 
It is love of perfection. The one great love, as it is written. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In Genesis 17, 1. Furthermore, the scripture says, And God said, Let there be light. By the word light is meant perfect love. In other words, by means of the fire of Brit Esh, the pact of fire, in the sexual act, we had to sacrifice all of our animality. We had to annihilate our lust. We had to annihilate to sacrifice our anger, etc. In other words, we had to work on the annihilation of our ego because to the sexual act, which is the fear of the Lord, is how we utilize the energy of our divine mother Prakriti or brazen serpent, Shekinah, in order to balance our three brains, the three gunas, and this is precisely what we had to do in order to develop perfect love. Moses taught perfect love to the multitudes by means of the brazen serpent. Perfect love is that which manifests itself in two different ways or aspects and merits only to be called such. There are those who love God if he grants them wealth, length of days, offspring, worldly prosperity, and success in their businesses or enterprises. But hate and disregard him if the will of destiny or the good law brings them misfortune and suffering. Perfect love is that which changes not, but continues and abides the same in all circumstances be they joyous or adverse. We should therefore love God even if he takes from us life, health, yes, everything we hold dear. That's what the Sohar states. So understand that the two different ways or aspects of perfect love are associated with the first commandment. Jesus said, Thou shalt love Yodhava, thy inner Elohim, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, mind and with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, two different ways or aspects, hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40. Nevertheless, people are happy with God only when God gives them everything. But when they are submitted to trials, when they face their karma, they then start complaining. <coughs> Look what God did to me. I who is a meek sheep. I who is working with others. I who is a righteous one. I who is in chastity. And look now, I am passing this terrible ordeal. Listen. Those terrible ordeals happen because we need to develop perfect love. Perfect love is not just to say, oh, God is perfect love. Marty Samael says, the monad needs to reach perfection in mastery. When the monad reaches the fifth initiation of major mysteries, it has gained the right to be named a master on the earth, but not a master of perfection. Masters of perfection are different from those that only reach the fifth initiation of major mysteries. Master of perfection have developed perfect love. Those who reach the fifth initiation of major mysteries know what love is. 
to a certain degree. Yet, Master Samael Onveor stated, only those who learned how to receive the negative impressions, the unpleasant impressions from the neighbors with gladness, with love, have developed perfect love. Behold an instance of perfect love. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucify him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them deride him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged rail on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself in us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? You see, the fear of God is the first commandment. Seeing that thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justify, uh, justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I said unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Gospel of Luke 23, verse 33 to 43. Nonetheless, we, in our alchemical marriage, when our spouse in wrongly behaving, when our spouse is doing something unpleasant, there we show very clearly that we have not developed perfect love. Matthew Samuel said, Alchemists must learn how to receive with gladness, with love, the negative impressions of their spouse. If your spouse is treating you badly, Learn how to receive that with love, yet not with masochism, but with love. That is, by understanding that he or she is not perfect. This is easy to explain, but difficult to practice when we are with our spouse, who indeed is the first one with whom we should learn perfect love. What about love thy neighbor as thyself in the street, our family, our acquaintances, the people who we, don't, we do not know? We must also learn perfect love with them. Listen, if we make an inventory of reactions where we should have shown perfect love, all of us lose, right? All of us will be losers because we have the ego alive. About the trials, in order to develop perfect love, it is written. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loveth this light bread. And you have sent 
fiery serpents among the people, and they beat the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against yod and against thee. Pray unto yod that he take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And yod said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Numbers 21, verse 5 to 9. The serpent of brass is an alchemical alloy done through sexual alchemy. It represents the very essence of the Shekinah, the essence of the Divine Mother upon a pole, upon our spinal medulla, by worshiping her divine presence on the sexual altar of love, is how we manage to develop perfect love. She is the only one that can help us to develop perfect love, because she is the very essence of perfect love. Listen, we worship the Divine Mother, the serpent of brass, not only by saying every day, Oh, Divine Mother, I love thee. That is not enough. To worship the serpent of brass and live means to annihilate those egos related with our unpleasant reactions against our neighbor. Because the one who annihilates those egos is the Divine Mother. She knows that the three gunas are unbalanced in us. She knows that the three gunas are the three traitors, Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas, in us. She knows that the three traitors are very alive inside of us. So Jehovah Elohim, the Holy Spirit, who is the husband of the Divine Mother, said, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten, when he looks upon it, shall live. So if we cannot control the serpents that are beating us, those ordeals sent from Geburah, we do not develop perfect love. Because we cannot, if we have the ego alive. So let us worship the Divine Mother. Let us worship the brazen serpent. Because my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, says the prophet Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. Please understand that to worship the brazen serpent is not a matter of having a picture of a brazen serpentine sculpture or a live serpent in our home. No. No. To worship the brazen serpent means to work with alchemy, to work with Brit Esh, the pact of fire, by being a Zadik, a righteous one, by riding the serpent from the coccyx all the way through Zion or that fortress, which is the city of Zion, by carrying our cross on our back from the coccyx to the Mount of the Skulls, which is our head, Golgotha. This is how we do it. Yet, in the Bible, this is written with symbols. This is how alchemists understand this. Otherwise, it is worthless. The Zohar continues associating perfect love with the fear of the Lord, or better said, with awe of the Lord during the sexual act where we also develop perfect love by means of the annihilation of our egos 
defects and vices, which relates to the second precept. It is as stated, the fear of the Lord is inseparable from his commandments, especially that of perfect love, and happy the men in whose life and conduct they are manifested and conjoined as it is written. Blessed is the man that is continually in awe, since the one whose heart is presumptuous shall fall into evil. Proverbs 28, verse 14. For his fear and love are so associated that even if misfortunes assailed and overwhelmed, it matters not. He is unmoved, and his heart becomes not hardened, so that he falls into sin. So hard. Master Jesus gives us an example of being continually in awe. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, it is written, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. <coughs> The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give thighs of all that I possess. Tithes. Do you see how the Pharisee is acting? This is the Pharisee ego inside of us. When we start working with these teachings, and we are in chastity, and we are annihilating the ego, all of a sudden we are feeling better than others. When we practice meditation, we say, Oh, this other person just comes here and listens to the lecture, yet does not do anything. But I do meditation, vocalization, and I laid my ego. So I am advancing. Yes, these poor people who listen to the lectures and do not do anything, they are going to hell. I feel sorry, I feel sorry for them. Yes. This is how many Gnostics behave. Yet the public that listens is precisely the publican who recognizes that he is a sinner. And the publican standing afar off will not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote up his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Looked, chapter 18, verse 10 to 14. Yet, to be exalted is not as many people think. If I humble myself, I will be exalted, and maybe I will all of a sudden receive a special invitation to come here and will receive a reward in front of everybody. Thus, they will say, oh, this man is so holy. No. God will reward you in secret. So it is not to show off, to boast about humbleness. Yes, people think that in order to be humble, we have to boast about it. Listen, that is not humbleness. That is to be like that Pharisee who always protrudes through many Gnostics in this day and age. And not because I am lecturing about it, and not because I am saying it, this shows that I am not doing it. Oh, they do it, but I am not doing it. No, I am also doing it. Listen, sometimes pride is silent. Sometimes we do not boast about it. But we think about it. Oh yes, 
I am good, but I do not say it because if I say it, I will show my vanity and that is no good. So I boast about it in silence. Matthew Samuel says, the Gnostics should work on mystic pride and mystic vanity, which in us is very strong, unfortunately. Thus, if we want to develop perfect love, we have to imitate David or Perseus. David holds the head of Goliath in his left hand and his sword in his right after he decapitated him. Perseus does the same thing. He holds the head of Medusa and holds also the sword after he decapitated her. Who is Medusa? Who is Goliath? Is that evil will that we have within? The evil will that is always ready to do wrong things, but not the commandments of the Lord. We develop perfect love when we alchemically accomplish the first commandment. In the Bible, Samuel anoints, anoints uh, Saul as king of Israel. Saul is written with the letters Shin, Aleph, and Lamed. These are the same letters that spell Sheol, hell. Yet Saul is how it is translated in the Bible. So, Saul means hell. Saul was the first king of Israel. Now let us talk about Saul alchemically. Saul, who was the first king of Israel, symbolizes the alchemist that reaches the fifth initiation of mayor mysteries, and who is therefore controlling his archetypes, his Israel inside. Because Israel, according to Kabbalah, relates to the heart, to Tifereth, Jacob, the Malachim. Thus, Sheol, or Saul, is a king filled with ego. Saul is a king, a malachim, an angel, a master, or the fifth initiation of major mysteries. But he did not kill Goliath, as David did. Saul is a Sheol, hell, or better said, a Hasnamus, a Marut, with double center of gravity. In Gnosticism, we explain that all of us are Hasnamusen because we have ego and we have consciousness, two polarities. Yet, to be a Hasnamus with double center of gravity is different. This means somebody that has reached the fifth initiation of major mysteries and he still has the ego alive, thus making troubles with his ego with his Sheol, with his hell. That is why when you read the story of Saul or Sheol in the Bible, you find that he is an anointed one because he is a master, a malachim, a king. But he is not doing the right thing and this is why God gives the kingdom to David. But who is David? David is not Sheol. The master that reaches the fifth initiation of Mayor Mister is still filled with problems, with Klippoth, with Sheol, with Hell. His egos emerge from Klippoth and make mistakes because his ego is alive. So Saul is Sheol. Yet David is the one who kills Goliath. And this is why the Bible states Sheol or Saul has slain his thousands, yet David his ten thousands. This is a very alchemical Kabbalistic statement. By studying the tree of life, we know very well that the soul or that the soul of Saul relates to Klippoth, but the soul of David to Malkut, up to Keter. Thus, when we read that David killed his ten thousands, we then say, ten means ten sephiroth. In other words, 
David is a master that reached perfection, perfect love, perfection in mastery. It means that he is not only perfect in Malkut, but also in Yesod, Hod, Netzach, Tifereth, Geburah, Chesed, Binah, Chokmah, and Keter. David developed his soul in all of the tree of life. Such is the work that the Master Samaelon Beor performed along the second mountain. Thus, to achieve all of the levels in Yetzirah until reaching perfection in mastery is what the book of Zohar calls perfect love. Thus, ten thousands is a symbol Kabbalistic. Yeah, uh, ten thousand is a symbolic Kabbalistic quantity. It comes into my mind right now a statement among the Gnostics. They say that the Master Samael stated that we have 10,000 egos. Thus, through meditation, we inquire why the Master Samael said we had to annihilate 10,000 egos. Well, that is an alchemical and Kabbalistic statement. However, Intellectuals think that the Master Samael was counting his egos. We do not think so, since he always said when parodying uh, Virgil, the poet of Mantua, though we had a thousand tongues to speak in a pallet of steel, we will not be able to fully enumerate them all. So he also said, the day, date, and hour does not matter. Likewise, the exact intellectual quantity of egos. We do not think that when he was annihilating his ego, he worried about knowing the exact number of psychological aggregates he already annihilated and kept counting them to finally reach 10,000. But we comprehend that the count he was doing was Kabbalistic. We understand that, the first, that he first annihilated the egos in relation to Malkut. And then, as he explains in the three mountains, he continued with the Enneagram from Yesod until finally reaching Keter, the top of the tree of life in the world of Yetzirah or the world of formation where he achieved perfection in mastery. That is to say, 10,000 Kabbalistically speaking. <coughs> so please, do not say that we have to annihilate 10,000 egos because that is ridiculous. The many egos that we have are innumerable. We know this. Understand, 10,000 means perfecting Malkut, Yesod, etc., until reaching Keter. All of this in the world of Yetzirah, in order to achieve resurrection. That is what David and Perseus represent. Perseus. Sheol, Saul, has slain his thousands, and David. His ten thousands. The letters that spell and David are Vav Dalet, Vav Dalet. David means boiler in Hebrew. Such a boiler is precisely Zion, the spinal column, because we have to boil our creative waters with the fires of the Kundalini the fires of Prakriti. This in order to balance the three gunas, which are perverted in any initiate that has the ego alive. David did it by means of Brit Esh, the pact of fire, by being a Zadik, a righteous one, and by cutting off the head of Goliath. Saul reached mastery because in order to reach mastery, you have to kill a lot of egos. You have to kill a lot of bestiality within, in the first mountain. But the second mountain is more difficult. 
Saul did the first mountain. But David did the first and the second mountains. In this day and age, in Gnosticism, there are many masters that reach the level of Saul, Sheol, hell. They kill a thousand. But the only one who killed 10,000 is Master Samael on Beor. Because he reached the top of the second mountain and developed perfect love. That is, perfection in mastery. Such is the meaning of 10,000. And it's not as many people think that every time that they meditate, they say, today I kill one, and in another meditation, this time, I kill two. They meditate again and say, now I kill three, now five, and so on and so forth. And you get anxious because they have to keep ahead since they want to reach 10,000. So the way of the fool is ludicrous. We have to study Kabbalah and alchemy in order to understand what we are doing in relation with the slaughter of the 10,000 in all of the levels of the mind. Because Aleph means thousand in Hebrew. Thus, 10,000 also means to work with the three primary forces because the letter Aleph symbolizes the spinal column or letter Vav, the firmament that divides the waters from the waters. These two waters are represented in the two letters Yod, which are above and below the transversal letter Vav that makes the shape of the letter Aleph. This letter means thousand and represents the alchemical personal work that we have to do with the two waters in the central pillar of the tree of life, the letter Vav, our spinal column, in each one of the ten sephiroth. Thus, if we do not know alchemy and Kabbalah, then we wrongly interpret what the Master Samael said. And what other masters said are some people who literally interpret what is written in the Bible and say, Oh, they will kill 10,000 people. And Saul only kill 1,000. Since at that time, women were dancing and singing and worshiping David because he was a bigger killer than Saul. This is commonly interpreted common interpretation because people do not understand that all of this is a psychological symbol. So do not read the Bible or any other sacred book literally. Otherwise, uh, ignoramuses might think that in order to be a great initiate, one needs to be a killer. One needs to kill people. That's ludicrous. In this day and age, religious ignoramuses launch people into holy wars. Thus, fanatics go and kill their brothers, believing that after that they will go, after that they will go to paradise with their egos of assassination alive. They don't even kill a thousand, let alone ten thousand egos of their own, because their ego is very fat. The three gunas, the three traitors, are very fat and alive within them. Other Gnostics state that the three gunas are related with the three aspects of the Divine Mother, when the matter is clearly stated. We must search with infinite yearnings within each one of us for these three assassins of the secret master, so that finally, on a given day, the date, day, and hour does not matter. We will exclaim with all the strength of our soul, The king is dead! Hail to the king! It is clear that the first treacherous one is indeed the loathsome demon of desire. It was unquestionable that the second disloyal one is a horrifi horrifying demon of the mind. It is evident, clear, and the definitive that the third traitor is the vile demon of evil will. 
Judas is the first. He is the one who sells the secret price for 30 silver coins. Pilate is the second. He always washes his hands and declares himself innocent. He never recognizes himself as guilty. Caiaphas is the third. He never does the will of the Father. He abhorred the Lord and still is abhorring him. The origin of these three evil traitors is indeed extremely tenebrous. It is undubitable that they are at the outcome of the frightful perversion of the three gunas. Parsifal on veil by Samael on veil. The Divine Mother has five aspects, yet they state that the three gunas relate to the three of those five aspects. This is ridiculous. Every aspect of the Divine Mother has three gunas within it, because the three gunas are just the primordial matter with which the Divine Mother works in any universe. Thus, do not mistake the Divine Mother with the gunas. <coughs> One thing is your mom, and another thing is you. Your mom is your mom, but the outcome of your mom is you. The gunas come from the prakriti, but they are not the prakriti itself. Do not, do not mix things. Let us see what the Matthew Samael says. Whosoever wants to be born again, whosoever wants to achieve final liberation, must eliminate the three gunas of the prakriti from their nature. The one who does not eliminate the guna sattva becomes lost within the labyrinth of theories and abandons the esoteric work. The one who does not eliminate rajas fortifies the lunar ego by means of anger, covetousness, and lust. We must not forget that rajas is the very root of animal desire and the most violent passions. Rajas is the root of all conscuspicence. The, let, the latter is, in itself, the origin of every desire. The one who wants to eliminate desire must first eliminate the guna rayas. The one who does not eliminate the guna tamas will always have the consciousness asleep. He will be lazy. He will abandon the esoteric work due to slacking, inertia, laziness, lack of willpower lack of warmth, lack of a spiritual enthusiasm. He will be a victim of the foolish illusions of this world and he will succumb to ignorance. Samael Amber. The critis means modification or the outcome of the three gunas. Yet the critis and the three gunas are not the divine mother. They are the outcome of the primordial substance, Prakriti, which is the Divine Mother in any of her aspects. Now let us study the third alchemical precept. There are actually 14 precepts that we must study. Why 14? Because 14 is the letter Nun, the 14th arcanum called Temperance which is the way the alchemist mixes in his firmament, his spinal medulla, the superior water with the inferior waters. When the septenary man is sexually united with a septenary woman, the sum is the 14 arcanum of the tarot, Samael on the or. So the third precept teaches that the Lord of the universe is an all-powerful being who is yod and also claims his unity by the reciting of the six words of the Shema that corresponds with the six direction in space with a fixed intention to do his will. The word one, ehad in Hebrew, in the Shema should be equal in duration to the pronunciation of the six words. This is why scripture says, Vav Elohim said, 
Let the waters, Mem, under the heavens, Aleph, be gathered together into Ehad, one place, and let Dalet, the dry land, appear, and it was so. What we have just read is the third alchemical precept, according to the Zohar. But if you don't know, if you don't have the clue of alchemy and Kabbalah, you will not understand it. Let us unveil it in order for all of us to understand, because we are the times of the end. First, the Shema is a prayer that the Orthodox pray every day in the morning and in the night. It says, Listen, Israel, Yod Chava is our Elohim. Yod Chava is one. In Hebrew is written, Shema Israel, Yod Chava Elohim, Yod Chava Echad. This prayer has six words in Hebrew in total. The prayer proclaims the unity of God, but how do you understand such a unity? First, because the evening is the woman and the morning is the man, and the evening and the morning was one day. But in order to make that one day, we have to unite man and woman in the sexual act. This is why the letter Het in the word Echad, Aleph, Het, Talet, is there. <coughs> what is Aleph? Aleph is a spinal column with the two waters, whether in the man or in the woman. The upper waters are the cerebral spinal fluid, and the lower waters. <coughs> are the sexual fluids, and the two are divided by the spinal column. That is the shape of the letter Aleph, alchemic speaking. In synthesis, what is the letter Het? We already explained that the letter Het is a man and a woman united, or uniting their spinal fluids. In other words, men and women uniting their valves, the three of lives, their spinal columns, since the letter Het means life. Do you comprehend the alchemical sexual point of this matter? <coughs> Let me explain it to you. When the Aleph of the man is united with the Aleph of the woman, head then emerges from them. Then we have Aleph and Het that is pronounced Ech. And this word means sibling brother. Then we, by adding to them the siblings, by adding to them Adam and Eve, the Ech, the siblings, if we add the letter Dalet to them, which is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which represents the Tetragrammaton, we make of them a unity, a had one. This is why the word a had means one. Such is the alchemical explanation of Aleph, Het, Dalet, a had one. The prayer says, Hear Israel, your Chava Elohim is one. Comprehend that. 
Israel is one in the sexual act because all the archetypes of Israel are one in the heart. And when we say, Shema Israel, listen Israel, understand that in Kabbalah, in alchemy, the words listen, hearing, and Israel are associated with the letter Vav. So when we say, here, listen, Israel, we are saying, listen with your heart, with your soul, with your consciousness, through your spinal column. Why? Because in your spinal column, you have your seven chakras. And in order to, in order for the soul, Israel, the human soul, to listen to God, Israel, the soul, had to develop the seven churches of Asia, the seven chakras. There is no way that someone will understand God or hear God if they do not have the seven chakras developed in their letter Bav, in their spinal column. And Israel means your archetypes, all the parts of your human soul. So in order to hear, we have to develop our Buddha Datu, the chakras, the Kundalini. What becomes one? The sexual fluids of Elayam, our sea goddess, the mist of Ma, Adama, become one in our heart during the sexual act, says the wife. Who becomes one? The cerebral spinal fiery fluids. Hashamayim of our God. The sea God. El Chaim. The reign of me. Become one in our heads. During the sexual act says the husband. The who and the what of husband and wife become one during the sexual act. Their Yod Chava become one. The king along with the queen in Malkut during the alchemical sexual copulation while concentrated on their pineal gland, vocalize. Me. Immediately after, they concentrate on their hearts and vocalize. Ma. And while visualizing, the Shakti potential of their sexual fluids rising from the bottom of their spinal towards their pineal gland and storing it within their hearts, they vocalize. Oh. Hear, O Israel! Yod, hey, me and ma, from Yesod, unite to Vav in Tifereth by means of Da'at. Therefore, during the sexual alchemical copulation, our Elohim, I A O, Yod, hey, Vav, Keter Chokma and Bina within our hey, our physicality, is one. Yes.
in the very sexual act, from the bottom to the top of our spinal column, there are no more gods but one. The prayer states, yod He vav He is one, because yod He is Ja. When the Yod fills the gap of the letter He, then you form the letter Het that represents the two forces of Hai, Haya, the soul of Bina. The same happens with Vav He of the holy name Yod He Vav He. The Vav fills the gap of the second letter He. Thus, we have two letters Het. One above and the other below. The head below is Shaddai El Chai in Yesod. The Elohim made with Brit Esh, the pact of fire. In the lower Eden, with the sexual union of husband and wife. And the head above is Neshamot Chaim in Da'at, the breath of the Elohim above in the upper Eden, formed with the union of two Akashic breaths, Ava and Aima Elohim. Ava and Aima united in Da'at, the throat the upper Eden, and husband and wife united in the sexual act in Yesod, the lower Eden, are yod he vav he the lower Elohim below and the upper Elohim above. And all of this forms a unity in the alchemical sexual copulation. This is the reason why the scripture says, the Vav, the spinal column, the serpent of the upper Elohim said in the sexual union, let the sexual waters of Mem under the heavens of Aleph be gathered together in Yasod, the lower head of Ehad, one place. And let Dalet, the dry land, appear, and it was so. The waters under the heavens are united in the sexual act. Who and what are the waters under the heavens? What are these? Our cerebral spinal fluid and the semen are the waters under the heavens. We are in Malkut. And we are under the heavens. Because the heavens of Yetzirah, the heavens of Bria, the heavens of Atziluth are above Malkut. And our physicality is Malkut. So the waters under the heavens are gathered together into one place when we perform the alchemical sexual copulation. This is how we gather Hamaim, the waters of our cerebral spinal fluid and our sexual fluid in the alchemical sexual copulation of husband and wife. Who, when alchemically, physically united, form the lower letter Het. Hai, life. This is how we unite the waters under the heavens into one place. What is that place? That place is the spinal medulla. The pole upon which we uh, lift the serpent of brass when we transmute our sexual energy. When we unite the Shakti potential of our sexual waters. This is how we lift the serpent of brass upon our spinal column. So the spinal medulla is the one place where the waters are gathered together and let the dry line appear. 
What is the dry land that appears? The dry land that appears is that knowledge in the solar bodies. Because from thence, from that, the upper Eden flows down. Vav, the river, which in Hebrew is Naher or Nahera, light, brightness, prana, the Shakti potential of Elohim. And the river parted and come into four heads, the four points of the letter Dalet, the four rivers of the lower Eden. The name of the first is Pison, that is which encompasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is bedellium and onyx stone. The land of Havilah is our dry land, physical body. And the goal of this land is the solar atoms from our seminal, seminal system. That is to say, the semen's potable gold. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. This second river is a cerebrospinal fluid, which is the other pole of our seminal system. With it, we encompass the whole land of Ethiopia. That is to say, the whole of our head and throat, since we form the brain and throat with the cerebrospinal fluid. And the name of the third river is Hidikel. That is it, which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The river that goes toward the east of Assyria and the river Euphrates are the two poles of the woman's seminal system. Therefore, the woman is toward the east of men because woman is the door of paradise and this door is always towards the east. Samael on Beor. The letter Dalet is the fourth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Dalet points to the four rivers which are under the heavens. When the Shakti potential, the spirit of their waters, gathers together in the spinal medulla, then the dry land appears. This dry land also represents the solar bodies. So when husband and wife, through sexual alchemy, know how to gather all of these solar forces together inside of them, they are then born again of the water of the Spirit. Genesis chapter 1 verse 9 means that the waters of the rivers running into the ocean of marrow, which is your head, may testify of the unity of the six directions. Stress should be laid also upon the letter Dalet in the word Echad, that means one. The numerical of it being equal to four and indicating the four directions of the rivers. For this reason, this letter in the word Echad, one, occurring in this verse, is always written larger than the other letters. The attestation of the six points of, or directions having been made should be confirmed by six other words, which are, Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever, the Zohar. Now, the first prayer above, Hear, O Israel, Yahavah is our Elohim. Yahavah is one, has six words. And the second prayer below, Blessed be the glory of his kingdom forever and ever, also has six Hebrew words. 
six above and six below. What do these two prayers symbolize? They symbolize the unity. Six above represents the six sephiroth that form the true man, the inner man, namely Hesed, Geburah, Tifereth, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. These six sephiroth are represented by the six masculine protruding points of the six-pointed star. Malkut, which is a feminine sephira, represents the physicality that receives, captures the six attributes of the true man, the inner man. Malkut also represents Eve, who receives, captures the six attributes of Adam. The female is always receptive. Thus, the six below are represented by the six feminine entrances, the six feminine openings of the six-pointed star that receive the six masculine protruding points of the six-pointed star. Do you understand that we are talking about the Star of David? When we, count, uh, when we count the six masculine protruding points plus the six feminine entrances or openings, symbols of man and woman, in the Star of David, we then have 12 vertices. That is why the Master Samael on the Or stated that the Star of David has 12 points, not six. This is why Jacob, Israel, Tifereth, the son, engendered through Vav the river Nahra, Nahra, light, brightness, prana, 12 tribes, 12 children, 12 archetypes in Malkut. These 12 archetypes are the offspring of the four rivers in Malkut represented by the four women of Jacob. Better said, the 12 tribes of Israel are the offspring of the sun through the four rivers of Eden. These four rivers represent the creative sexual waters of, of husband and wife in the alchemical sexual copulation. This is Kabbalistic alchemy, when you know how to interpret when you know how to read, otherwise you fall into mistakes. The Zohar states, in recognizing this sexual unity of these rivers of Eden, symbolized by the letter Dalet, Adam walks on dry land. That Prakriti brings forth as archetypes trees and fruits. This is also why Elohim called the dry land earth, which is Malkut, twice mentioned, land and earth being one and the same, the Zohar. Prakriti is the primordial land, earth, Adama, ground, because in Hebrew the word Adama means also earth, above and below. This is how you see it alchemically. And Elohim saw that it was good, symbolizing the unity above and the unity below. When this took place, the earth, the Prakriti, was able to bring forth fruits and flowers. Thus, by means of this sexual alchemical work, we become in awe of the Lord, and we also develop perfect love within. And by the union of the solar light extracted from the four rivers of Eden, 
between husband and wife, the dry land appears, which are the astral, mental, and causal bodies. Then our inner Elohim will say, I see this is good. Because then your astral, mental, and causal solar bodies operate as one unity within you. Thanks to Vav, the spinal column, the serpent of brass that rises in the spinal medulla. Because through that, to that womb, the spinal medulla is how she creates. The Vav, the serpent of the upper Elohim, said, Let the sexual waters under the heavens be collected into one place, so that Vav, the dry land, appears. Vav was so. As we see, everything happens in our spinal column. The three and a half coils of the serpent are symbolized in Mexico by Quetzalcoatl, who in the beginning emerges from the mouth of a serpent. The half coil is represented by the face of a man being born from the serpent, and a man who, who latter must be swallowed by the same serpent. Do you see? There are many interpretations of this symbol, yet, in my understanding, this is simple. When the three coils, which represent the three gunas, awake harmoniously within, then the half coil, the true man, appears. The man is engendered within our spinal column. Thus, it is the serpent that gives birth. This is why in Gnosticism we say, all the gods are children of Nut, the Divine Mother. Nut is Prakriti. She represents the serpent that rises, the brazen serpent that was healing the Israelites in the wilderness. The serpent that rises in the spinal column and gives birth, beginning with the astral body. This is why you see that the face of Quetzalcoatl protruding from the serpent's mouth. Quetzalcoatl represents the astral body, the very beginning of birth, spiritual birth. Nobody can be born again if he does not lift up the serpent of brass, as Moses did it in the wilderness. Because to lift the brazen serpent is the same as to lift up the son of man, the son of our sexual waters. This serpentine force is called Kundalini in Sanskrit the Christic force that rises in our spinal column, and that builds the city of Zion, our fortress, which is our spinal column. When we are righteous, a Zadik, when we work with the Nun, this is how Vav, the dry land, appears. Because really, every single body that we create is the offspring of the serpent, beginning with our physical body. Even though our present dry land physicality was not created in chastity. This is why John the Baptist called all of the people that were born from fornication, from the orgasm, vipers. He did not call them serpents. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O oh, generation, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I said unto you, that God is able of these stones to rise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Matthew chapter 3, 7 to 10. So our dry land physicality is not the offspring of the 
brazen serpent because we are vipers. That is, the offspring of the tempting serpent of Eden. Yet, through the sexual work of alchemy, we will become children of the brazen serpent and will be called plume serpents, feathered serpents, or serpents of brass like Moses because we develop Prakriti, the Divine Mother Shekinah, inside of us, which is Adama, from the dust of Adama, the earth, Jehovah Elohim formed Adam. Thus, this is also symbolized in the Aztec pantheon by gathering all the waters of the seas of Yesod, and this is what we call good sexual alchemical work. Thank you very much. Your question, you ask, uh, uh, they have trouble understanding what the Vikritis is. Let me tell you, whatever we do with the three gunas is Vikritis. Because the three gunas are the basic elements within the bosom of the Divine Mother, the Prakriti, and they are granted unto us because we have to learn to be Elohim. Whatever we do with the three gunas is Vikritis. Yes? Or you ask, related to the explanation of the four punishments from the Zohar that associate them with the earth formless and void, darkness upon the abyss and the spirit of Elohim hovering upon the face of the waters. That you have trouble understanding how strangulation and stoning and decapitation, etc., relate to it. Well, okay. It is a good question and simple to answer. If we know Kabbalah and alchemy, to begin, concentrate your mind on your spinal column, your brain, and your spinal medulla that float in the cerebral spinal fluid, and on your stones, which is your thought. Because in those waters is where the Spirit of God hovers. Those are the waters, thus, when you are not a fornicator, when you, when you are in chastity, God shines as light in there. That light is the flame of the sword that rises in the spinal column to the brain. That is the flaming sword, which is light, which is the same spirit. Because that spirit is the Divine Mother and is also Christ. Christ is born from the Divine Mother and is also related to the throne of your innermost. That is the sword that you receive when you are in chastity. The power of that sword is the word that is expressed through the tongue of your mouth. The tongue is a tip of that sword. Thus, if you have that light in your spinal column, that means that you or your vav, your spinal medulla, is enlightened with the seven chakras. Thus, you can hear the words of your inner God very clearly and write and understand what other masters wrote in different books because they also heard the voice of their inner God and they wrote that inner God, what their inner God commanded to them. So obviously, right now, we are tohu vevohu, formless, formless and void. So that is what we are now, 
but uh, <coughs> we were in the anim when we were in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, and mineral kingdom, that light was shining in our spinal column because the spinal column of the elementals, of minerals, plants, and animals are always enlightened because they are innocent. But when the elementals enter into the hum humanoid level and fornicate, when they do not do Bereshith Bera Elohim, or Beret said, Brit Esh Bera Elohim, they then expel the Elohim within because they fornicate. We, the intellectual animals, fornicate. Therefore, we do not follow the first commandment. And that is what the book of Zohar states regarding Bereshith Ber Elohim. We killed, we expelled the Elohim within because we continue being animals. Thus, when we were in chastity, all the light of the spinal medulla, all of the light of our sword was going into our heart, and our heart had superlative intuition, which understood God, the highest. But when we fornicated, strangulation happened, meaning that the light no longer went into the brain. We are self-strangled because when one strangles another person, one prevents the flow of the blood from entering into the brain and also the breath of God from entering the lungs. Thus, the circuit of breathing stops when someone is strangled. Thus, fornication is a strangulation too. Because when we fornicate, we strangle ourselves. We become formless and void, empty of life, since your stones are sending your life down, and therefore the light that before was rising up is now going down, and you remain in darkness. Thus, the spirit that is the yod in your pineal gland that was hovering upon the waters, withdraws from your head. Thus you suffer decapitation because you fall headlong into the abyss. Yes? Your question now, okay, uh, about the need for sexual alchemy you said that you read about some masters that perform the sexual act in the astral plane instead of the physical plane. So, can we perform the sexual act in the astral plane instead of the physical plane? No. There is a reason why we have physical bodies. If that was true, why will we have physical bodies? What will be the reason for the physical bodies to be created if that theory was true? That we could just do uh, the work in the astral plane. Many masters that have astral bodies can do many works that we cannot do. That is true. But we, beginners, need the physical body. Malkut, the queen, Prakriti. You see, our physical body is Prakriti, really. But because we do not respect the Divine Mother, our three gunas are in turmoil. They are the three brains, the three traitors. Through them we only create bad things, and because of those vikritis, we cannot control the gunas. But the Divine Mother helps us. This is why the Buddha is seated under the body tree, controlling the three gunas. And this is why a serpent is behind holding him, floating upon the waters. That serpent is the Divine Mother. The same happens with Moses in the wilderness. He is teaching the people to worship the serpent of brass, which is the Divine Mother, 
because the people are being punished and suffering because of the passionate serpents that come from above because they have the ego alive. So Moses taught them how to worship the serpent, which is precisely the development of the fires of the spine in Zion by being a sadic. And in that way, we enter into the path in the physical world because we begin from the bottom. If you have the astral body, then you will know what to do with the astral body. But if you don't have the astral solar body, but rather the body of desires named Kamarupa, the lunar astral body, then what are you practicing in the astral plane? So tell me about your dreams. What kind of dreams do you have? Wet dreams? Thus, if what you experience in the astral world is wet dreams, indeed, uh, those dreams are not related with mastery, but in relation to the perverted r guna rajas that we have to control, and only the Divine Mother can help us to do it. This, in order to escape from Klipot, the bowels of Malkut, the shadow of the tree of life. Because the inferior astral plane, Hod, relate to Lilith, the abode of the fornicators. So those who physically or astrally reach the orgasm during sexual copulation have no part in the tree of life, which is Israel, especially the middle pillar. So their place is in Klipoth, deep down inside the bowels of Malkut, and not beyond. Indeed, because the fornicator intellectual beasts of the earth draw out their spirit from within their spines. This is why Hod, the astral body, is the first body that we have to create. And only the Divine Mother can help us from the very foundation of the tree of life. Thus, we first have to annihilate the egos from the bowels of Malkut, and she will help us to do it. We have to balance the goodness in the physical body and in every body of Seir Ampin till reaching 49 levels. Your question? Oh, what about Dakinis? Well, Dakinis are female masters <coughs> that materialize in the physical plane in order to help great initiates to reach chastity in the physical plane and to perform other works. They are astral female masters for male masters, not for beginners. The only thing that can materialize for beginners are demons, as well as vampires and incubi or succubi. Your questions, uh, uh, oh, are the gunas perfectly balanced in every master? No, they are not because if they were, they will not be in manifestation, creation. Creation happens because the three gunas of the Ain Sop are unbalanced. Only the Paramartha Satyas have perfectly balanced the three gunas in themselves. If they want to appear in creation, they can do it, but just because of their compassion. Yet, all of us who manifest in the universe in creation do so because the three gunas are unbalanced within us. And not only in the physical body, but in all of the bodies. I understand that perfection in mastery, or what we call perfect love, relates to compassion. The perfect balance of the gunas in each body and to the six degrees of objective reasoning. The Divine Mother, the manifested Prakriti, 
is the one that helps any bodhisattva to enter the absolute. Let us read uh, uh, what the Master Samael uh, wrote in esoteric astrology related with this. He comments, Swami Vivekananda has said that tempting gods appear when the initiate tries to enter into the absolute. They offer to make him a king of certain zones of the universe so that he does not become liberated. These tempting gods have not been able to become liberated. Thus jealous of their own hierarchy, they tempt the candidate, candidate to prevent his entrance into the absolute. Those beings are a thousand times more dangerous than humans. Through many Mahamantaras, those gods liberate themselves from the planetary masses to finally enter the indescribable bliss of the absolute. Nevertheless, there are certain logoi, like the god Sirius, governor of about 18 million constellations, who still have not managed to, liberate, to be liberated from the cosmos in order to enter the absolute. This is written in Christ's Will by Samael on the Or. Behind the unmanifested Prakriti is the unmanifested Absolute. It is necessary to first enter within the unmanifested Prakriti, the Ains of, before submerging ourselves within the bosom of the unmanifested Absolute, the Ain. Esoteric Astrology by Samael on the Or. Master Samael also explains about this very clearly in the Three Mountains. Sequentially, when the Bodhisattva reaches the top of the second mountain, everybody says, Sheol, hell, kill a thousand. But Samael on the or, along the second mountain, his ten thousands. That is to say, David killed his ten thousands because David represents the spinal column. David is a symbol of the spinal column within the fire, or with the fire of the Divine Mother Kundalini balancing the three gunas. Yes, your question? Or you state that Yogananda and Sivananda annihilated some percentage of their egos. Yet, you never read or heard them talking about the annihilation of the ego. Can we clarify this? Yes. <coughs> In the Kriya Yoga of Yogananda, the bad psychological tendencies, which are what we call ego from the Latin or Greek languages, are named with different Sanskrit words. Even Sivananda talks about these bad psychological tendencies. But he does not call them egos. The Latin or Greek ego is called in Sanskrit asura, meaning demon. And its evil tendencies are asuya, jealousy, or envy. Kama, lust. Mada, pride. Loba, covetousness. Greed. Kroda, anger, wrath, etc. In this lecture, we talk about the gunas, and Sivananda talks about how to balance the gunas. In Buddhism, these evil tendencies are called samskaras. In us, the evil tendencies from the three gunas are called vikritis. These are the outcome of the unbalance of the gunas. Yogananda eliminated these evil tendencies on a certain level, because in order to destroy the 10,000 evil tendencies as David or Samael on the or did, we first have to reach mastery. We have to awaken the consciousness. First, 
That is, we had to annihilate our 1,000, which is the level of Shaul or Saul. Once we annihilate uh, uh, 1,000, then we keep ahead, and along the world of the Yetzirah, like David, we annihilate our 10,000. Or your question means, can, can I explain in which manner are the three traitors related to the three Gunas? Okay. Let us read first what Master Samael on the or stated about this matter. The origin of these three evil ones, these traitors, is indeed extremely tenebrous. It is indeed indubitable that they are an outcome of the frightful perversion of the three gunas, Parsifal unveiled. Therefore, we understand that each of the three traitors is related to all the three gunas, because obviously the demon of evil will, which is Caiaphas, is related to the three unbalanced gunas in the causal world. Judas, the demon of desire, is the outcome of the unbalanced goodness in the world of Hod. We can also say that Judas relates to Rajas, strong desire, but Caiaphas, which is also called evil desire, relates to Rajas as well. Pilate, which is a demon of the mind, is also associated with desire, but in the mind, Netzach. But when we talk about the goodness, we can also say sattva, which is knowledge, wisdom, is in the head. Raya's desire is in relation to the heart, with the emotional brain. And tamas, inertia, doing nothing, laziness, sleep, relates to the motor brain. Yet the gunas have many subdivisions that we know and learn when we advance on the path. Otherwise, we will just uh, utter intellectual concepts. Like many Gnostics who still think that they had to literally annihilate 10,000 egos because they do not understand Kabbalah and alchemy. Yes, they literally think that they have exactly 10,000 egos to annihilate. That in Kabbalah is called limited stupidity. Yes, your question, what can we tell about Solomon? Is he related to the third mountain? Shaloma, Solomon, is related to the last work that the initiate does on top of the second mountain, which is when the initiate is transmuting his mercurial bodies into pure gold after having annihilated his 10,000 egos. The initiate enters as Solomon into the third mountain, which is something very high, only for gods. But do not worry about that right now. Yes, your question is, what does the Bodhisattva mean? The Bodhisattva is body and sattva, wisdom and knowledge. Your question, was William Blake a great initiate? Well, I personally like William Blake's paintings to illustrate my lectures, because in my opinion, they very well suit some Kabbalistic statements, but not only his paintings. Obviously, William Blake was an initiate, because when you see his drawings, it is pretty obvious that he knew what he was doing. Yet, at his time, it was not permitted to publicly and clearly talk about esotericism. So when I see his work, it is obvious for me that he knew about esotericism. 
What level of mastery he achieved? That I do not know. What I indeed know is that I like his drawing. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.